In late May 2019, we released our first ever documentary, an hour-long road trip deep into New England to learn more about what might be the most exciting brewing scene in the world. Whilst there, we learned there was so much more to it than juicy IPA, lobster rolls and cues for cans. In fact, we visited five completely different breweries that could claim to be the greatest in the world at what they do. So over the next few weeks, we're going to give them the coverage they deserve by using all the amazing stories they had that didn't make it into the documentary. This week we're up in Burlington, Vermont, a buzzing university town next to the beautiful but apparently sometimes frozen over Lake Champlain. And it's right down by the water that you'll find foam brewers. Foam splintered out of Switchback, a local but pretty large craft brewery, when a few production team members decided they wanted to be a bit more inventive in their brewing. They quickly got a reputation for making stellar hazy IPAs and mixed firm beers. But for us, the most striking thing about Foam is their philosophy of using local ingredients, talented artists, and maintaining what has to be one of the most beautiful and welcoming brew pubs we've ever been to. We start there with a tour from brewer and co-founder Bob. So we really took kind of a traditional brew pub model and uh, revamped it, I guess you could say. We wanted people to come to us. We wanted the beer to be poured in our facility, our establishment. We really wanted to be able to kind of control people's environment when they're drinking our beer, especially to start out. Um, so put a lot of money and time and energy into uh, the aesthetics of this place. We opened it up with um, this brew house just like this. We kind of added a few things here and there, but um, it's a direct fire, seven barrel, uh, Bennett Forge Work system made for us out in Colorado. It's, it's a little workhorse, that's for sure. I mean, it's pretty simple. We really wanted to set it up so we can really be doing the brewing ourselves. Um, we have a control panel up there, but it's just for uh, VFD control, pump control, and um, also for the hot water tank because uh, seven barrel all the way across. We have a seven barrel hot water tank, so it's a little undersized for a traditional brewing system. Um, and especially because we use that hot water tank for all of our hot water needs. We started off with four seven barrel fermenters and quickly realized that we needed more. Um, so we added five and six and then eventually seven. Uh, and we had another space for one more fermenter and we decided to drop in a uh, 10 barrel fooder from well, Fooder Craft Foods. It's American white oak, uh, lightly toasted and steamed, so it doesn't have a lot of tannins left in the wood. Um, and it, Really has a nice citrus character that it promotes, that it um, that it, the beer picks up in there. We do a lot of different styles of beer. We're always doing new things. We've brewed about 650 times uh, over the past three years, and 275 of those beers have been different beers. Um, so that includes double IPAs, IPAs, pale ales, uh, you know the big hitters, of course. And then we have our mixed culture fooder beers. Um, we have uh, any style you can really think of. We've done. We haven't done a brown ale but um, maybe sometime. <laughs> Variety isn't the only thing Foam focuses on. Championing local ingredients is really important to them, and having a busy brew pub means they can educate their customers firsthand about the benefits. So we're trying to support our community as well as the community supports us. Um, and like I said, it's part of our philosophy, it's part of our plan opening up. So we are able to pay that extra cost for these stuff, these um, ingredients that are sourced locally because it's not cheap. Uh, yep. <laughs> so you're, you're really trying to find the, the balance between um, sourcing something that's great, but you have to kind of eat that cost as well. And like I said, it, this model allows us to do that customer interface and everything. Yeah, you can have a conversation and go, well, this exactly. is a dollar more because yep. the malt field's over there. Exactly. Yeah. We're working up there as brewers, working on the brew house platform as people are sitting there drinking the beer. So it's, I mean, you still get the person that says, where is this beer made? <laughs> but, yeah. Where's this from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, that, that it's kind of, again, bringing that connection back to where your beer is coming from or where you know the, where your food is coming from and reconnecting with it. Exactly. Because I think there's a huge disconnect in our society to, like from where your food is coming from or where your drink is coming from. And um, Vermont's a special place because people really care about that stuff. Um, so it's nice and it's in some ways it's easier for us to really promote that and show where it is. Bob had work to do, so after that we met up with Jonathan Farmer, another founder. He has a brewing background too, but now spends most of his time on the visual and marketing side of the brewery, most notably the huge number of artists they use for their cans. So I'm here with John, uh, one of the founders of Foam. 
Yep, I'm one of uh, five of the, the founders of Partners. Five, so. five, five founders is quite a, quite a lot. What's the story of Foam at the start? Um, so yeah, five, five partners is quite a lot. Uh, thinking back, I can't imagine doing it with anything less than anything. five par <laughs> partners, knowing how much work it's been. Um, but we actually all connected at another brewery in town. We all worked at Switchback for a little while. That's how we overlapped. Um, and all kind of had a shared vision for what we wanted to do, had a, some experience in the industry, uh, and complemented each other in different ways. Todd, who was, uh, he's like the most experienced brewer among you guys, yes. he had a sort of a side project already that was mixed firm? Yes, so um, Foam was kind of started, the concept was started by Bob, uh, our head brewer, one of my partners, and Sam, another brewer, uh, and one of my partners. Uh, they were starting the concept of foam while Todd was actually pretty far along with House of Fermentology, uh, which we now kind of defer to as our uh, side project mixed fermentation barrel program. While that was all happening, Todd was actually all of our boss at the time. Uh, he was the production manager at Switchback. It's a tangled web. Yeah, it was a tangled web of, of things. <laughs> and, uh, and one day, Bob and, and Sam invited Todd out for a beer, and I, uh, apparently he thought that they were going to quit. And so he was not in a very good mood. <laughs> and then they actually invited him to start the brewery with him. We're quitting, but can you come? Come with us, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, long story short, they ended up deciding that it was actually the, the perfect marriage. We were all close friends, uh, worked together, really respect each other, and realized that Foam and House of Mentology could kind of have a beautiful relationship. Um, and so the original beers that House of Mentology released were the wort was brewed at a number of breweries around the area. There were some brewed at uh, Zero Gravity, some at Fiddlehead, a few different spots. Uh, but now all of the wort for House of Rentology is brewed at, at foam, and then we towed it over and fermented over um, in that space yeah. and packaged it over there. And so Switchback was getting pretty big, I think, at yep. the time. You guys started again, started small here with a brew pub mm -hmm. kind of vibe. Was that because you guys wanted the, the smaller yeah. approach, the hands-on approach to brewing. In the 90s, 2000s, the goal was to get as much, many different draft accounts as possible because that's where people were buying the beer. Um, and what that in turn did to the industry was it meant that you kind of had to have your staple beers uh, that the bartender knew what they were pouring day in and day out, it held a line, and that was a great thing for the business. But what that does to production is it means that the brewer is brewing the same beer or the same two or the same three beers day in and day out which is great for a lot of reasons, but it doesn't necessarily, like brewing is very much manual labor, but it's also very much creativity and science and the, the, the aspect of creating something new is a beautiful intellectual challenge. Um, and when you brew the same thing day in and day out, you start to lose that once you get to know it in and out. Um, so the, a big part of the inspiration for starting Foam was to, create a space to create a brewery where we we were able to brew beers the way we wanted to how we wanted to do it um, and that in turn meant to create something that was very small um, that was a lot of the inspiration for for starting it and just kind of doing our own thing um, all, we all have a different but overlapping interests in music and art and I think that foam is really an expression of our, our team here and and who we are as individuals as well as as a brewery so I mean we really just kind of started off brewing beers that we really enjoyed drinking um, and so that range when we opened up we had a Pilsner on we had a, two Saison's um, a wheat beer and then a couple of a couple of hoppy options uh, which all kind of fell into that softer more aromatic uh, arena of IPA this is when we first opened up, people were starting to use different terms for what that was, but it wasn't accepted that it was New England IPA. There was still debate whether it was Vermont IPA or New England or just IPA. So um, we were just brewing hoppy beers the way that we enjoyed drinking them, and that tended to be have a gentler bitterness, really focus on the aromatic qualities. Um, and yeah, I think it, it, next thing you know, we were having folks line up for, for those beers. and. We were brewing them more and more often, and it kind of just snowballed from there. And you mentioned uh, that you work with local artists. Uh, you guys love music. Um, I feel like there's a lot of different influences in this tap room. Lots of uh, like almost steampunk kind of tap handles and, and that beautiful foam logo. Who who is behind sort of the, the visuals of it? 
I would say that's definitely um, a group effort between the five of us as well as very much of the, the rest of the team here these days. Uh, it started off with, we actually worked with Russ Bennett, who is a designer and contractor and kind of architect in Vermont. Um, he, we had a bit of a relationship with him through Danny and Todd ahead of time. Um, and he's designed a number of things around Vermont commercial buildings as well as residential. Um, and so when we were first designing this space, we had a lot of crazy ideas. We were thinking, okay, if we're gonna, rec at this time there was some breweries that were doing all on site, but very few. So at this time when we were planning it out, we were like, all right, what are we gonna, it's kind of crazy to expect everybody to come to us. So if we expect people to come and enjoy the beer here, then we have to create an atmosphere that people will enjoy or at least we think we people would enjoy. So we worked with Russ, kind of a mix of word vomit and everything else of just all sorts of crazy ideas of what we appreciate in places. Um, and then he distilled that down, all that nonsense, and uh, somewhat of a cohesive idea yeah. that is what you see here. Which like is when you some, brew a beer and you condense it down yeah. into a, ah, that's what we're brewing. Exactly, exactly. So, and, and very much the idea was to create a space that flowed, that encouraged conversation. You look at the, the curvature of the tabletops and the bar is really... I thought really, that was just me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just the beers, no. Um, and so that, that is very much intended to encourage conversation so that when you're at the end of the bar, it's not like you can only see the person to your right or your left, but you can talk to a person three, three rows down, uh, as, also, as well as having a combination of kind of smaller tables as well as this like longer row seating. So you might meet your neighbor as opposed to just focusing in on the one person that you're, you're with at that time. We probably could have gone a route where it was more focused on selling the beer and closing earlier or doing, coming up with, like, I, I really appreciate very clean, modern design, uh, and we could have done something in that realm for our can designs, for example, um, and it would have looked beautiful, get the job done, and be much easier to develop a new label for a new beer. Um, instead, we, from day one, we knew we wanted to work with local artists, so we go through extensive amounts of back and forth with the artists uh, and try to provide an opportunity for them to, to do what they do best and also have it represented well for the beer. Um, and, and it takes significantly longer. A lot of the, a lot of the la just the labels themselves that might come out with a new beer can could take three months, four months to work on. Um, but we, we find that it's 100% worth it. Um, you know, we'll show you the space next door in just a minute, but uh, this past Saturday was uh, a testament to how much other people appreciate that because we were, we took over a new space um, that we're still figuring out the exact plans for and, and w what's gonna happen over there. But we thought it would be really cool in the meantime to, while there's all these false walls that have yet to be taken down, we said, why don't we strip it down, get rid of all the extraneous stuff and then paint the walls white, take the carpet out, paint the floor white, and then invite some of the artists that we work with uh, to, paint murals on the space and do kind of an art opening, a one time only, one night only art show. Jonathan was kind of underselling it a bit, as we found out when we went over to the new space. It was a remarkable feat they'd pulled off, and it was kind of a shame it was going to be pulled down. As Brad is a designer by trade, it got him pretty excited and asking about their processes. Does the artwork come first? Does the name come first? Does the what inspires what? Does, does the flavor come first? And then you, you find the artist. A mix of everything. Free form. A mix of everything. I would say that at, in the very beginning, the 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 flavor and the beer came first, and then we were working with, we were coming up with a name that we felt fit it. Um, I mean, when we first built spill was the first can that we developed, and pavement was the next one after that, and built the spill was the very first music reference that we had Love. on our yeah. original lineup, um, and so that was this one that like a couple of us are, are big fans, and threw that up there, and then after. We actually released that beer and people were really loving it, loved the name. We felt great about it. We started doing that more and then when we did the next double IPA, it's like, all right, Build the Spill is not only an amazing band, but it's a great name for a beer that doesn't taste like it's 8%, but definitely Build the Spill if you have too many of them. And then this, so the next double IPA, we're like, Pavement, another great band that yeah. <laughs> gonna hit the pavement if you have too many. This space is temporary. Yep. None of this art is gonna live forever. No, no. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna destroy it. Well, not yeah. destroy it, but 
it's gonna change. The yeah. space is gonna change. What's it well, gonna be? Well, the, the, the sign right there, uh, Time Kills Art, is the name of the art show. There's a few different concepts behind that, um, but it's, it's been on our can since day one. Drink, uh, keep cold, drink fresh, time kills art, in the sense mm -hmm. that like beer could be considered a form of art, and you want to drink it fresh with the most part of it. Yeah. For most clean beers and stuff like that. Um, I mean, there, there's also the kind of idea that the most beautiful aspect of the art is the creation and the inspiration for that, and while a lot of value can be added after the fact, and a lot of beauty can be in, as mm. part of that over time. Um, there's also like a lot of negative aspects of that value. Yeah, value that's accrued upon something over time. Ex exactly. Whereas, like, so, the frenetic energy of, of something happens in the moment. Right. Beautiful, and it's not like you're not thinking about the value of it. You're just involved right. in the creative process. It, exactly. It's clear that in its short history, foam has become a hugely popular part of the community. Why wouldn't it? given the support it gives local farmers and artists, as well as the beautiful place they've created for people to socialise. It's interesting how outside of Vermont, all the talk around foam is about the beer. But in Burlington, it feels like it's a whole lot more than that. For food and beverage, basically, almost everybody spent the last two weeks putting together these incredible murals. Um, and then we had this art opening where I feel like half of Burlington came out to, and it was just this amazing night where nobody was making money off of the event, but everybody, the amount of energy that was there and like good vibes that were passing around was, was absolutely worth it. And I, I feel like, I was actually just talking to Charlie who's here right now, and he's one of the artists. I, I can't imagine being the artist that's, that's putting in that much time and effort to something and coming up, I mean, he traveled up from New York just for this event, and hopefully we're doing something right if, if they're willing to do that for us. Um,